Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show and let's just jump into it. And the first thing I wanna talk about today involves a very troubling situation. It involves a lawsuit between a company, Brilliant Earth, suing a guy by the name of Jacob Worth. Now the name Jacob Worth most likely does not sound familiar to you. Putting him in the thumb or title, it's not gonna bring in views. And that's actually why it's really important we talk about this. It's the little guys that are easily manipulated, pushed aside, squashed. So where does this story start? Well, it starts April 26, 2017. Jacob puts out a video called The Brilliant Earth Diamond Scam. Now, when it comes to diamonds, there's a thing called conflict diamonds. If you've ever seen the movie Blood Diamond, you might be kind of familiar with this. Conflict diamonds are diamonds that are illegally traded to fund conflict in war-torn areas, particularly in Central and Western Africa. The UN defines them as diamonds that originate from areas controlled by forces or factions opposed to legitimate and internationally recognized governments and are used to fund military action in opposition to those governments. So hopefully you have a general understanding of what that is. Now, as you'd imagine, there are a lot of consumers out there that want to make sure that they're diamonds had no connection to all the horrible shit. And so a big selling point for a lot of places, including Brilliant Earth, is conflict-free diamonds. And so in his first video, Jacob Worth takes aim at Brilliant Earth. They built a massive business offering something called the Beyond Conflict-Free Guarantee. What they do is they sell diamonds guaranteed to be mined from Canada. Logic being, if it's from Canada, no one lost a limb or died mining in Africa, which is great. Curious thing though, and it's back to what I was saying before, you can track a diamond's origin. So how is Brilliant Earth guaranteeing their diamonds are from Canada. Either they are more effective than the UN or they are running one hell of a scam. I just had to find out. And so then Jacob, wanting to look into this further, orders a diamond ring from Brilliant Earth and he points this out. When it arrived, it came with three things. A diamond ring, a Canadian certificate with no identifying numbers on it, and a GIA certificate with the certification number, which everyone knows to be totally useless for tracking a diamond's origin. But to prove it, I took the diamond to a GIA facility to see if I could get it recertified. They gave me a brand new certificate with a new certification number, meaning this diamond could have been recertified many times and have had many different owners. Basically, you can't track a diamond's origin with any of this crap. So that already looks pretty bad, but then it gets worse. Jacob mails back the diamond and then two weeks later tracks it down to the supplier. Two weeks later, I followed the diamond back to an Indian supplier in New York City's diamond district named Siraj. The supplier was advertising his diamonds on a diamond trading platform and he was listing their GIA numbers. There was no mention of them being Canadian. And so at that point, he asks the supplier who has listed this same diamond, not as a Canadian diamond. Although the first time Jacob got it, he had a certificate saying it was Canadian. Is it a Canadian diamond? And this happens. Is this a Canadian diamond of any chance? No. No? no. Okay. That's the exact same diamond I purchased from Brilliant Earth and returned two weeks ago. It's now sitting in this guy's office. Do you have any Canadian diamonds in this office? But this isn't Canadian. No, this isn't. Okay. Now, after that first video received traction, Brilliant Earth posted this on their website. And there they have a letter from the supplier himself saying that that diamond actually was Canadian. And Jacob's response to this is he says that that looks like it was coerced. Brilliant Earth also defending themselves in a blog post saying, the video claims that it is not possible for a retailer to trace the origin of its diamonds. This is false. With respect to our Canadian diamonds, our suppliers provide proof that they purchase rough diamonds from Canadian mines. Adding, because transparency and ethical sourcing are so central to our mission, we conducted a third party audit last year to independently verify the origin of our diamonds. The audit by SCS Global Services examined the diamonds we offer and independently verify that our diamonds are traceable to their origins and confirmed our chain of custody of protocols. And the third party, the auditor that they point to is a group called SCS Global. They say SCS Global confirmed our chain of custody. But there's also a sketchy situation there because when a journalist from the nextweb.com was doing an article on this, Brilliant Earth reportedly agreed to let the auditor take questions from this journalist and then reportedly canceled the interview with no warning. And the journalist points out that there is no regulatory body for the auditors. They refer to the situation as pay for play and also points out things that the audit ignores. Now at this point, Jacob tries to explain the pipeline and why he doesn't think that this is accurate. Diamonds are first mined and then the rough diamonds are passed by the syndicates over to site holders who are like preferred buyers. Then they are sent to manufacturers that polish the rough into polished diamonds. The polished diamonds are then sent to diamond trading centers where they are passed around to as many as 10 different suppliers before finally being sold to the store. Now the only conceivable way to track a diamond's origin is when the diamond rough is sectioned off and the second it's polished it's immediately tattooed with an insignia like a polar bear or maple leaf. Then it's handed over to suppliers to trade around. This is supposedly foolproof. The diamonds I followed up on didn't have any of these markings. At this point, this is what we know about tracking a Brilliant Earth diamond. Brilliant Earth sent me the diamond. Brilliant Earth got the diamond from the supplier. And the rest is impossible to track all the way up to the mine. The only thing Brilliant Earth can do is ask their supplier what country it came from and just take their word for it, which is exactly what I did next. And that, of course, brings us to the supplier who initially said in the video, 
no, that is not a Canadian diamond. But in the Brilliant Earth blog post, they have a document of that same person saying that it was a Canadian diamond. But Jacob also went a step further. He realized this was one diamond. What about the others? This Indian guy is telling me none of his diamonds are from Canada, yet 80 of his diamonds are listed on Brilliant Earth as mine to Canada. I then tracked down hundreds of other Canadian diamonds on Brilliant Earth. Every diamond led to the same 10 Indian suppliers. Does any of your diamonds have Canadian certificates? No, no. I don't have any supporting documents for those. I don't have any Canadian certificate. And none of them are selling Canadian certified diamonds. Here's where things get really messed up. Other jewelry websites are carrying the same Canada origin diamonds as Brilliant Earth, and they aren't labeled from Canada. This diamond found on Blue Nile, not from Canada, is also on Brilliant Earth, labeled from Canada, and $2,500 more expensive. It's the exact same diamond. The certification numbers are the same. So I call Blue Nile. You're calling Blue Nile. This is Sam. May I help you? Uh, would you be able to tell me if this specific diamond is Canadian? No that one doesn't come up as being sourced from Canada. So it's not Canadian. I'm certain it isn't. And so a question you might ask, and, and it's something that Jacob hits on, is, okay, so as we understand right now, it's impossible to know where a diamond came from. Fine, but that also means, Jacob, that you have no proof whatsoever that these diamonds didn't come from Canada. And the answer, he argues, is yes, that is actually the problem. It's impossible to make that claim. I don't know where these diamonds are from, nor does Brilliant Earth, and that's the point. Brilliant Earth was supposed to guarantee the origin of their diamonds. They were supposed to be different. Brilliant Earth found the niche ethical diamonds and blatantly defrauded people. This isn't Canadian either? No. Okay. None of this works. So now to the big update. Jacob is being sued by Brilliant Earth and his name thrashed around in the press. And the past day, Jacob put out a video on this lawsuit and he, and he points out some specifics and it's also, here's a big point. Well, the first video he put out on Brilliant Earth got 800,000. The second one got a little over 100,000. This video where he's talking about the lawsuit. As of recording this video, it only has just over 13,000 views. What you have here is big giant company versus little guy with a small voice right now. If not for maybe the internet. But I'll let Jacob explain key parts of the lawsuit. Brilliant Earth just sued me for defamation in New York Supreme Court, and it's filthy. The lawsuit says, I am associated with several adult-themed escort and drug dispensary web addresses, including datesbythehour.com and grasspackages.com. I purchased those domain names years ago. I don't even own them anymore, and I've never had any businesses on them. Either way, it's totally irrelevant. The suit then goes on to say, I'm involved with Operation the Listed and Fringe Economies of Gambling, adult entertainment, drugs, and pawn shops. Gambling because I play in the World Series of Poker. Adult entertainment and drugs because I bought domain names. Not kidding. It also says, I'm cultivating an online presence for escort and drug dispensing services as the owner of domain names, including datesbythehour.com and grasspackages.com. According to my lawyer, in a defamation suit, you win by proving my claims false. Brilliant Earth is going a different route. Instead of countering any of my claims with evidence, they're trying to drown me in legal fees and attack me personally by putting this garbage on public record. I'm thinking they're hoping the media picks us up and shames me into taking the videos down. He then goes on to show how his name is being dragged through the mud in the media and I do not know what I would do if I was him. A jewelry company that prides itself on being ethically sourced says it's the victim of a smear campaign by a shady pseudo journalist with ties to escort services and a drug dispensary. I'm also involved with operation illicit and fringe economies of gambling, adult entertainment, drugs, and pawn shops. Basically, I'm a criminal overlord. Here's the New York Post. Smear campaign painting a rival as a purveyor of blood diamonds also could draw business to his own struggling company. The narrative Brilliant Earth created is a drug dealing pimp, me, attacking a legitimate company that, and the media ate it up. And he then goes on to explain that as of right now, there are lawyers investigating as to whether they should file a class action lawsuit. He tells people to go to brilliantearthclassaction.com. There they say, if you bought a diamond that Brilliant Earth advertises Canadian, Russian, or Botswana sort, you may be eligible to take part in a lawsuit. And asking people to submit there. And so that's where the situation is right now. Looking at everything right now, the, the situation with Brilliant Earth, incredibly sketchy to me. The way Jacob's been getting thrown around in the media, very troubling. And really just having a show that gets in front of about a million people a day, it, it felt like a situation that needed more eyes on it. It's so easy for the little guy to be suffocated. But that said, I want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts around this? Also, have you or anyone ever bought a diamond from Brilliant Earth? And I guess just in general, I want to know where, you, where, where you're landing on this story. So let me know in those comments down below. And I will say, I'm not saying this is 
is one way or the other. In fact, I, I was even a little bit iffy about covering this story from the beginning. And part of the reason for that is Jacob's not just a YouTuber. At the end of his exposed videos, he has a link to his website and business, IWantWhatIt'sWorth.com, and it is a pre-owned jewelry business, so in part, the video kind of plays as an ad. So there's a way you can see this where he's not just a bold hero purging and exposing evil because I have a cape. But also to argue against that, even if he's incentivized, if, if, if what he's showing is true, does that take away from the argument? But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today and today in awesome. And the first bit of awesome is something you hopefully feel some ownership for, and that is the Philip DeFranco Show has been nominated once again for the News and Culture Streamy Award. Last year we won Best News and Culture, we also won the audience vote, the audience choice for Best Show of the Year. As of recording this, that one hasn't been announced yet. Voting for the audience choice starts later next month, and then for Best News and Culture, there's no voting on your part. But our competition this year is Cheddar, Complex News, Now This News, and The Young Turks. So. Uh, this should be interesting. But no matter what, win or lose, thank you so much for making this show what it is. Then I gotta share a fantastic video from our buddy Jax Films. In a YouTube environment of exaggerated beef diss tracks being released, he has released a compliment track. Then in technically it's a sponsorship slash ad video. It's on the Cricket Wireless YouTube channel, but I'll push that aside because it's just, it's adorable. It's John Cena being surprised by fans and it's just, it's just adorable. It makes me feel something. That's getting more rare by the day. So uh, had to give it some love. Then we got a new trailer for the Matt Damon movie, Suburbicon. We've got Brian Cranston doing a video talking about being Walter White. And if you want to see the full versions of everything, I just shared the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links, as always, are in the description down below. Then in hacking slash leaking news, a bunch of celebrities just had nude photos and videos leaked to the internet. Those hit include Tiger Woods, Lindsey Vaughn, Catherine McPhee. You also had Miley Cyrus, Kristen Stewart, Stella Maxwell. Specifically on Tiger Woods, reportedly sources are saying Tiger himself was not hacked, it was Lindsey Vaughn. The photo of Tiger Woods was from when they were together. Also, as you'd expect, several of their lawyers have said they will sue anyone posting these pictures to the internet. That seeming to be both an open threat to individuals as well as to the specific websites that this is their whole business model. And of course, there's the criminal side to this. You might remember with the fappening, which is still one of the largest celeb hacking and photo leaks ever. The guy who was prosecuted for that was sentenced to 18 months in federal prison. Now, will this get to that point? We don't know right now. But a question I want to pass off to you with this story is what is your feeling around these kind of leaks. I found in the past that the public response to stuff like this, it, it ebbs and flows. Are you one of the people that feels bad for them, you see these celebrities as victims, or are you one of the people that are of a mindset of, well, if you don't want nude photos of yourself sent out there, don't send out nude photos to other people. That's an inherently risky thing to do. I'd love to know your thoughts. And then let's talk about Donald Trump in the news, and no, it's not because he either did or did not wear eclipse viewers while looking at the solar eclipse, but instead this has to do with his announcement on what's happening with the war in Afghanistan. And a lot of people are wondering what Donald Trump was going to say regarding Afghanistan because before he got into the White House, he was all about pulling out. In the past, tweeting out things like, 84% of US troops wounded and 70% of our brave men and women killed in Afghanistan have all come under Obama. Time to get out of there. Krizai of Afghanistan is not sticking with our signed agreement. They are dropping us like dopes. Get out now and rebuild US. We should have a speedy withdrawal. Why keep wasting our money? Rebuild the United States. A suicide bomber just killed US troops in Afghanistan. When will our leaders get tough and smart? We are being led to slaughter. But last night, Trump's words were very different. Also a note before moving forward, I am going to jump cut the president's speech because he was reading prompter and it was incredibly slow. If you wanna make sure nothing's being taken out of context, link to the full video down below. My original instinct was to pull out and historically, I like following my instincts. But all my life, I've heard that decisions are much different when you sit behind the desk in the Oval Office. In other words, when you're president of the United States. So I studied Afghanistan in great detail and from every conceivable angle. The consequences of a rapid exit are both predictable and unacceptable. Okay, so he's changed his mind. It's a far more complex situation. What is the strategy? A core pillar of our new strategy is a shift from a time-based approach to one based on conditions. I've said it many times how counterproductive it is for the United States to announce in advance the dates we intend to begin or end military options. We will not talk about numbers of troops or our plans for further military activities. Conditions on the ground, not arbitrary timetables, will guide our strategy 
from now on. So there's no official big announcement on the number of troops being sent, but it is being reported by some outlets that the president has approved 4,000. That would add to the existing force there, which is around 8,400 right now. And as far as nation building being a part of the strategy, he said this. We are not nation building again. We are killing terrorists. The next pillar of our new strategy is to change the approach and how to deal with Pakistan. We can no longer be silent about Pakistan's safe havens for terrorist organizations, the Taliban, and other groups that pose a threat to the region and beyond. Pakistan has much to gain from partnering with our effort in Afghanistan. It has much to lose by continuing to harbor criminals and terrorists. And so here, a lot of people saw him as just much more forward on Pakistan than Bush and Obama. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson using slightly softer language after Trump spoke, saying, Pakistan has suffered greatly from terrorism and can be an important partner in our shared goals of peace and stability in the region. And we had one of the final notes from Trump, which was, Finally, my administration will ensure that you, the brave defenders of the American people, will have the necessary tools and rules of engagement to make this strategy work and work effectively and work quickly. I have already lifted restrictions the previous administration placed on our warfighters that prevented the Secretary of Defense and our commanders in the field from fully and swiftly waging battle against the enemy. And so this is a very different approach from what Obama did. With Obama, troop increase decisions were the president's decision, whereas now Secretary of Defense Mattis gets this authority. And as far as the reaction to this, most of the people responded how you thought they would. The most interesting outlet to me, though, of course, was Breitbart. Steve Bannon of Breitbart went, of course, to the White House to be a key advisor for Trump. He recently left. Donald Trump tweeted about Bannon and Breitbart positively, and Breitbart, which has been very supportive of the president, was not happy, writing, this isn't about changing his perspective on the war. POTUS is a remarkably astute and stubborn individual. This was about the swamp getting to him. Then in response to the part of the speech where Trump says, our commitment is not unlimited and our support is not a blank check, which side note is incredibly close to what Obama said in 2009 about the Afghanistan war. Obama saying this effort must be based on performance. The days of providing a blank check are over. But to Trump, Breitbart responded by saying, it can only be a measurable victory, not based on conditions on the ground, or it is not a blank check. It cannot be both. Asking how, by the way, can a conditions-based policy be antithetical to nation building as we are being asked to believe? Conditions on the ground in Afghanistan will not change without the nation being built? Without their police and military being trained? Without their institutions growing up and becoming secure? Too many comments in this speech make no sense in the real world. Damn, that was not a response I was expecting from Breitbart. But a question I want to pass off to you is what are your thoughts on this? One, if you're open like that, let me know if you supported Trump before, you didn't support him before, and then tell me what you think about this most recent announcement and move by the president. And that, my friends, is where we're going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I try and do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you missed yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you want to see the newest behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.